All right. Test one, two, test one, two. Thank you. Just about another minute or so, and uh, we will get started. Give some people time to log on. <clears throat> Brian Avery, is that Brian Avery, my oldest brother's former medical school uh, roommate? All right, well, we will get started. As, as we've done through each of the Mondays of July, the month of July in the Catholic Church is dedicated to the precious blood of Jesus. Again, that follows the great focus in June on the Sacred Heart and the precious blood which flows from that, uh, from that Sacred Heart is the focus here in July. So let us use as our prayer tonight uh, this prayer of the precious blood in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O precious blood of our salvation, we believe, hope, and trust in you. Believe, deliver all those that are in the hands of the infernal spirits, we beseech you. Protect the dying against the works of evil, of evil spirits, and welcome them into your eternal glory. Have mercy on the whole world, and strengthen us to worship and console through the Sacred Heart. We adore you, O precious blood of mercy. O most precious blood of Jesus Christ, heal the wounds of the most sacred heart of Jesus. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, everybody. So, you know, I'd like to encourage everybody to, right now, share 
this feed, if you have expanded your feed, or even if it's in the small size, down below along the bottom to the uh, left of the you know, emojis, there's a share button, and just click that and share it to uh, your page, Share Now Public, and that'll help get other people to log on and enjoy and appreciate this. Uh, it gives us some opportunity. So just uh, take a moment down at the bottom uh, and just share. You want to share public uh, or share to your story public. So uh, that's just a little little thing to help grow this little effort, this little mystery. So yes, Brandon, thank you. Brandon's always quick to, to do things to help out in this way, in that way. So. Well, we do have a, a number of things we can start with. If you don't have any questions that will quickly pop up, uh, I've got a few uh, that were sent in earlier. Uh, so we can, we can start with those. There are, you know, let's start with an easier one. Uh, you know, uh, Ann Rice, who couldn't be uh, logged on tonight, she, our, our Director of Stewardship, she is celebrating one of her daughter's birthday uh, tonight. But uh, she asked that I might touch on uh, a Catholic road trip or Catholic staycation, some opportunities within just a few hours. And the first easy thing to do uh, for anything like this is there's a website, and it's a great website. The internet, there, the internet has plenty of problems, but there are some good resources out there. But there's a website called catholicplaces.org. So catholicplaces, all as one word, Org. And you can pick any state in the United States, and it will give you a list of the different shrines and holy places in that state. So if you go to Wisconsin, so let's say during this lockdown, you don't necessarily want to, you know, take a flight, take a long trip somewhere. You just want to be able to spend some time with your own immediate family, places that within a couple hours drive uh, are, are options for you and for your family. Uh, are really worth considering. So catholicplaces.org, if you go to the page for Wisconsin, um, you know, some of these I've been to. There is the, there are the Grotto and Shrines at Dickeyville. The big ones everybody knows about. Uh, St. Joseph at Basilica here in, Mil in the city of Milwaukee on the south side. The recently named, when I say recently, within the last, oh, 10 years, Basilica of Our Lady Mary Help of Christians, Holy Hill up in uh, Hartford in the Hartford Hubertus area. Then there's the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the bluffs outside of La Crosse. And then the newest, the, the first national shrine, uh, Our Lady uh, of Good Help, Our Lady of Good Help at Champion, Wisconsin, outside the city of uh, Green Bay. But then, you know, there's also there's, you know, in a place called Dickeyville, Wisconsin, they list uh, shrines and grottos uh, erected in the early part of the 20th, 20th century by the pastor of the parish there. There's the National Shrine of St. Philomena in Briggsville, Wisconsin, uh, established in the 1940s by Father Wiltsius there. Uh, so those are just different options that you have. There is the, um, let's see, I've gotten those, St. Anne's Chapel in Plain, Wisconsin. Uh, and then the St. Philip the Apostle Parish with a, a shrine and a grotto there uh, in, uh, in Rudolph, Wisconsin. So catholicplaces.org is where I would suggest you go. Um, I am actually going to leave, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, I'm going to leave on a couple of days vacation uh, in a few days, and I, I do, I drive, I like to drive, I don't mind driving, let me put it that way, I don't mind driving, so originally I was going to do a couple days, and I was going to go down to Florida, not the place to be in the COVID crisis right now, it's become uh, the biggest spiking hot spot, so instead, I at the last minute, uh, after we kind of worked out some details here in the house, uh, with the other priests, I decided that I would, I'm going to fly to Bismarck, North Dakota. No particular reason other than it's a place I've never been. And I can drive home over about a four or five day period and visit different places along the way. I did this last summer. I had to go to Rapid City, South Dakota last 
summer, a little bit before this time in the summer, and give a couple of presentations for Canon Law. And I decided that I would go and fly out and then drive back. And I visited, I, I visited the typical tourist stuff. I went to Wall Drug. I, I went to, uh, you know, Deadwood and things like that. But I also, I visited all the different dioceses along the way. I visited uh, Pierre, South Dakota, the capital, the only capital in the continental U.S. not on a U.S. In, interstate. Uh, things like that. So I just enjoy that. Uh, you know, a lot of books on tape uh, or audio books now and uh, some books to read where, wherever I uh, plan myself each night. So that's an opportunity. So so that would be uh, the the best resource that I can give you, a quick resource, catholicplaces.org. I think I can probably actually, uh, we'll do a quick, I'll write my own comment and put it into the comment section for you. And you can see where that is. There you go. Uh, Dan Gabler. Dan, thank you very much. Dan is always a good uh, attendee up at St. Eugene and always laughs at my jokes, which I like. Why have masses said, why have masses said on behalf of the dead? I've got an answer I provide to my Protestant brothers and sisters, but I want to make sure I've got all the bases covered. You know, Dan, probably the best part of that line is that you want all the bases covered. And that's, that's kind of what we do in, in so much of our Catholic faith. Some of the, the prayers we offer for the dead are, you know, we pray for the repose of the soul. So in the same way we ask, you know, the intercession of, of saints in heaven, we ask whether, you know, whether the person is awaiting their place in heaven, meaning they're in purgatory, that their sense of conversion, their sense of, discipline and, and accepting the temporal punishment for, for sins committed, uh, that it is still stalwart and strong, and that it is, you know, well utilized. We also pray, in a sense, as we pray for the repose of the soul of someone, we give great solace and comfort to the family. Because if the family fears that there's something missing, the same way we pray to a saint for their intercession, as I said before, to know that the Lord would hear prayers, please, you know, in, you know, bring the soul of my loved mother, grandmother, grandfather, whomever it is, into your presence. It really is, you know, it's, it's, it's the both of the here and now, those who need the prayers, those who are in mourning, and those who in their death and their hope for the resurrection, may need prayers to bolster them against paying the, the, you know, paying for the sins, the sufferings that they must suffer uh, in purgatory, and giving them that strength and giving that attention to their own wherewithal and their own love for God. So we're conveying a message and we're conveying an affirmation uh, to those. But it's as much for the living who need to know that people are praying for their loved one. We can offer an intention, the intention at Mass, offering a Mass for the dead. We can pray for an intention of someone who's alive, you know, someone who is, uh, a, a Mass intention could be someone who's going through surgery or sickness or illness or something like that. So, uh, so I hope that helps answer your question. Uh, that's the kind of the basic quick uh, response that I can give. And what is the difference between being a canon lawyer and a regular lawyer? <laughs> Uh, the difference for me is that I have three siblings who are regular lawyers, so I had to become both a priest and a canon lawyer to balance that out. No, that is a, uh, a humorous, I make a little light. I joke with my siblings and with a number of our parishioners, lawyer jokes. Um, so my law degree is specifically in terms of the church's legal system. Uh, it is one of the, it is the oldest continually run legal system in the world. It you know it's to you know there are elements of it that go back to the very first Council of Jerusalem and to almost two thousand years. There is certainly then jurisprudence that is rooted in the Roman legal system. So when I was asked to study canon law, I studied the theory of how the church develops a body of law and uh, applies it. It is different than the American civil system. 
Uh, you know, we could some night have Judge Dan Gabler kind of explain what precedent and what court precedent means in the English common law system the, that the American system most emulates and the difference between a, a, a law, a legal system in the Roman tradition. I, I have, I, you know, while I have a number of books here, you know, it's really just one code of canon law establishes the basic laws for the 1.2 billion members of the Catholic Church. Because the laws, you know, the exception doesn't make the law. The exception proves the law. We're getting into all of this, but the difference is I don't have a civil law degree. I can't practice law in front of a, a civil court uh, here in the United States, whether it's civil or criminal. I cannot, uh, oop, I forgot to turn this off again this week. Um, it is, but I obviously, I am the judicial vicar of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, which means I am the chief judge for the tribunal, the church court that is located here in Milwaukee. The most common things that people know about or commonly hear about that we deal with are annulments. And then a number of cases involving priests and the unfortunate things the priests have done. Um, we do some arbitration, essentially arbitration mediation, uh, if there is a uh, contentious disagreement between two religious institutions, our court could handle that as well. Um, but by and large, and then we're also in Milwaukee, the way it's set up, we are a traditional system, meaning as the metropolitan, as the archdiocese, we are the appeal court for the other four dioceses in the state. Each of them have their own tribunal. Green Bay, Superior, La Crosse, Madison. And so we would be the appellate tribunal, both levels. Anything beyond that, the third level goes to Rome, goes to either the Roman Rota or the Apostolic Signatura, two different types of supreme courts for the church. So probably a lot more than uh, you were expecting to that question. So uh, let's see, Marianne, uh, here's a recommendation. For an excellent restaurant in Fargo, Luna Fargo. Seriously, okay, I'll I'll write, I'll take that, I'll take note of that. Uh, I will be visiting Fargo, the the diocese where I want to visit cathedrals. Uh, so Bismarck, Fargo, uh, Crookston, Duluth, and then I'll come back down from Duluth. Are kind of so I'm going to do that northern tier of the country. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Mary is as someone had the question about a mass intention. Mary Martone, one of our uh, great parish secretaries. During this time of COVID, please call your parish office to schedule mass intentions. We are still taking mass intentions uh, during this time. Uh, do you have to take continuing education in canon law? How often does canon law change? So the first question you are not required to. There are there is a professional association, the Canon Law Society of America, uh, and there is then opportunities for uh, continuing canon law education, legal education, uh, but we don't have the same requirements as does like a state bar association with CLEs, continuing legal education. How often does uh, canon law change? Not very often. So. The first time the, the canon law of the church was put into a code, before it was just kind of a corpus. We would have these collections of, of laws that come from councils, that come from popes, that come from different settings. We would have some jurisprudence that would interpret it, but that's, again, not unlike American legal system. We don't necessarily use the jurisprudence as the as the definitive way to go forward. It is a guide, but, and it's an important guide. We had our first co codification in 1917. Then it remained almost unchanged, so we had nothing for the first 19 centuries other than collecting in one place the, the code. And most, lawyer, most canon lawyers, academic canon lawyers would work on, you know, if two different bishops did two different things, they had to try to remedy that. One of the first great legal minds, Gratian, canon law, he wrote a book called The Concordance of Discordant Canons, meaning he tried to use legal jurisprudence and legal theory to remedy what one bishop did over here 
and this bishop did over here to say, well, they were both right. And if he couldn't do that, then it had to really kind of be resolved by uh, the, the tribunals of the Holy See. Um, and uh, then, so 1917, a code of canon law. Before that, it was a corpus of canon law. Code of canon law, 1917, not redone until 1983. So it took about 65 years for a uh, decision. Actually, it was during the Second Vatican Council, right before the Second Vatican Council, that John the Twenty Third asked that the Code of Canon Law be revised, and then it was decided to revise it in light of the the theology and the innovations, if there were any, of in the Second Vatican Council. What's happened in the last couple of years? John Paul, Benedict, and Francis have all, by pontifical power, by the power of the Holy See. Uh, made some changes in the code. So we're getting a little bit more adept at changing individual parts. We're updating individual parts. We've updated the parts in the code of canon law relative to, again, the priest scandals. We've updated some of the parts relative to marriage and annulments. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, we're going to update some of the other uh, penal law, the, the criminal law of the church over the next few years. So there are, it doesn't change often though. It doesn't change. Uh, Joe Fricker, speaking of traveling, your tour of the Holy Land, are you planning on touring Yad Vashem? Uh, yes, that is my understanding. That is a very important part to go. I've never been there, but uh, Jennifer, uh, I know it is uh, truly, the, the, essentially the, the, the core Holocaust museum. Uh, so yes, that is part of our plan. Is the religious ed registration for fall up yet? You know, I don't know. Actually, Mary Martone might be able to answer that. She can type in an answer uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I don't think it is up yet, but I, I am not the definitive. Uh, I do not have the definitive knowledge of that right now, so I, I can't answer that. Some of you saw in the last podcast, we had some, we had two mugs made for two priests in a podcast. So uh, they're they're the only two in the, that exist in the world. Um, someone asked me today that we should uh, we should auction them off at the school auctions because they are so rare. Hey, I want to try something. Uh, I said last week I wanted to give you the little tour of the chapel here at the rectory and I'm gonna nope it's not giving me that option again never mind never mind I don't know why it is not giving me normally there's an option on uh, Facebook live to share the screen I wonder if I have to have that set up ahead of time but uh, right now I can't do it so uh, we will get that taken care of so another question not seeing one. I, let's see. Let's go to another one that was sent to me. Um, so someone wrote this question. And it's a very good one. Uh, I was talking with a, fan, a friend recently, and the topic of the St. Michael prayer came up. Now, the St. Michael prayer, we call it part of the Leonine prayers. Pope Leo really pushed these. And this was a prayer that was used, and it still can be used. It's, it's a personal prayer that can be used at the end of Mass, really to ask the... Um, you know, the, the defense of Michael against the works of evil, the works of the devil. Um, so the conversation that, that this person who sent me the question, Kevin, sent me the question, can you pray for the conversion and redemption of Satan? Actually, it's, there's a certain quality that makes it sound like a logical question. Can we pray for the conversion and the redemption of Satan? Now, while it sounds, it's a well-intended question, um, my first reaction was absolutely not. I mean, the devil's the devil is the devil. And, but then I thought, but why not? But really, the, the guiding factor here is Jesus' parable of the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. So you remember, this is not Lazarus, the presumed brother of Martha and Mary. This is Lazarus, who was part of the uh, a parable about a rich man who ignored this poor man Lazarus, who is in the 
who was in the, uh, you know, just in the street outside his home and never gave him any attention, never even gave him scraps from his table. And then at the judgment day, the poor man Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham and the rich man is, you know, is in fiery Gehenna. And he looks across the chasm between he and Abraham and, and Lazarus and just asks, is there any way he could cross this chasm? And and it said, no, there's no way to cross the chasm. That's not allowed, essentially. And then remember the, the parable, the twist of the parable is that he asked, well, can someone go and warn my brothers? You know, and, and they said, well, no. Or if he asked, let me go and warn my brothers. And, the, and Abraham says, no, your, your brothers have, you know, all the scriptures have all the teachings. But if someone comes back from the dead, they would believe. And the response is, even if someone comes back from the dead, uh, some won't believe. So I take that first part where the chasm between heaven and hell cannot be crossed other than when Jesus went descended into hell and opened the gates and released everyone who was condemned there or left there be just because of the lack of the redeeming quality of Jesus. He, and the devil was left there. Lucifer was left there. Lucifer did not take that opportunity to have a conversion. And if you're not going to have a conversion when Jesus descends into hell, as the as the Apostles' Creed tells us, we don't use quite that that verbiage in the Nicene Creed. But if if Lucifer is not going to have a conversion experience when Jesus descends into hell to open the gates of hell so that they might come into paradise. And then Jesus' own parable says that the chasm between here and there, meaning heaven and hell, is impassable. I kind of got to go with that. I kind of got to go with that. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the take there. I think it's a good question. I think what we need to do, it is always clear. In our faith, we believe the most powerful force in this world is Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ. What we have to pray for, maybe not so much the redemption and conversion, you know, the conversion and redemption of Satan, but is that people don't give him any more power. I mean, Jesus, excuse me, the devil is able to have impact in the world Whenever there's a moment when somebody gives him more power, uh, Cardinal Dolan had an article uh, a few years ago, a few months ago, you know, Jesus is the most powerful and the devil is the second most powerful. And so uh, we have to pray that nobody in any moment of their life decides to flip that. You know, that it makes it, you know, when it, when, when it may be in a crazy world like we have seen like it's 5149, you know, some days it seems the, it may not be. But if any one person says, in my life, the most powerful, 51, 49, I'm going to give it over to the devil today. That's where we, that's what we have to pray for. And those people, unknown to us by name, but those are the people we have to pray for. So I would say, rather than praying for the redemption uh, and the conversion or redemption of, of Lucifer, of Satan, we pray that nobody moves Lucifer or Satan in their life up to number one. And we do that in small, subtle ways. It doesn't mean they become, you know, a devil worshiper outwardly. It be, means that they decide that they don't have to care for, you know, their family, their neighbor. They don't have to love one another. It means they intentionally break with, you know, the, the norms of, of faith and of life. So, uh, so, you know, that's John Miller. Yeah, I watched the post. John, you were, uh, you were you were quick. I was uploading it, and it's I, I changed it. I can switch it to uh, to public so that everybody can watch it. Because I, I guess I'm just not going to be able to figure out a way to uh, uh, you know to play to play it while I'm doing the the live stream uh, cast. So I can probably I can change that right now so it's public. And anybody can go scroll. It would have been posted about four hours ago. And it's also up at my YouTube channel. Uh, so you can always go there. You can always subscribe to my YouTube channel in order to see past episodes of this, of Two Priests in a Podcast. Uh, just go to, you know, Father Paul Hartman 
uh, and um, I'll have to figure out. I don't have that showing right now, but I'll get that showing there. Uh, so let's see. Do you have a replacement? Uh, Joe's asking, do you have a replacement for next Monday if you are on vacation? Uh, no, I don't, and I see Emily is advocating for Father Jordan. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave that. To, I'll offer it to Father Jordan if he wants to do it. Uh, Jordan, you know, his baby is the two priests in a podcast. So that would be where he devotes most of his, you know, thought, energy, and, uh, and enthusiasm. Um, otherwise, this may be a good time just to kind of switch to every other week. Uh, kind of like we're doing with the two priests in a podcast, uh, do it every other week. Um, it'd be, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I I was out at my mom's today. Monday's my day off, so we're still trying to figure out post-COVID what my schedule is going to be. So, Marianne uh, Barragray, are those chess sets on the shelves behind you? Are you a collector? Yes, I'm a bit of a collector. I enjoy playing chess. I have not played with the regularity that I that I like, uh, that I would like. I played much more when I was living at the seminary, and I would play the students. Um, so I, I have, so back there that uh, there are just a couple of chess sets uh, of significance kind of across the bottom, uh, and I'm going to get this wrong whether it's your left or your right, but, you know, closer to the edge of the screen, there is a chess set from the Ukraine. Then next to it, there's a, you'll see little red pieces almost. That's actually a three-way chess board, a three-way chess, three-person chess. Then moving across the bottom is a chess set from uh, Uganda. I picked that up while I was in Uganda. Or excuse me, no, that one is the chess set from uh, Kyrgyzstan. From Kyrgyzstan. Then there's just one next to it, just kind of a little unique one of uh, made out of glass, all glass pieces. Up above the ones closer to the edge of the screen, right in the middle, there's a Beretta on the shelf. I have two chess sets there. One, the first one is from Uganda, so the pieces, you know, represent the Ugandan culture uh, around our, the Twinning Parish with St. Eugene uh, in Kukanjaro, and then just a very nice set that I is the one I often use uh, from uh, Rome, uh, made in Italy, uh, and it's the Romans versus the Goths, so it's the, that's the way they set up the two sets of pieces, uh, silver and more of a coppery look, but uh, Romans versus, you know, Germans or Germanic Goths. So those are my chess set. Uh, was heaven empty of souls until the ascension? Where did the good souls go when they died before the passion and resurrection? Well, okay, so first half of the question, was heaven empty? Not necessarily. The you know remember the story of the you know the, the descent, the casting out of Lucifer, was meant that the angels occupy heaven. So there were still the angels. The question you rightfully ask are what about the created souls of people? And the the general understanding would be that no, because with from the time of the fall, you know the the original sin of Adam and Eve until Jesus, you know, death, resurrect, death and resurrection, uh, there was not an opportunity. There was not sufficient conversion of heart. There was not su sufficient uh, payment for our sins. Only Jesus could afford that. So Jesus, as I said, the, Ap the Apostles' Creed says, Jesus descended into hell. And there, our belief, our theology is that he opened the gates. He opened the gates of hell and released from there all the souls of the just, of those who would be in heaven. So um, now we do believe, you know, we would say, if you look in the book of saints called the Roman Martyrology, the prophets are in there, the great, you know, patriarchs and matriarchs of the Old Testament. So those would have been the souls released, the, the equivalent of, you know, canonized sainthood, would be, you know, Isaiah prophesied the coming of the Lord. And that would be, the, you know, a soul that Jesus released, you know, and all of the names we hear, you know, in, in the Old Testament. So, uh, so uh, let's see uh, if he turns it down, ask Father Andrew, okay. Uh, why don't the priest wear the Beretta much anymore? 
Uh, so you see I have a Beretta there on the shelf in between the two of the chess sets. That Beretta is actually not mine. Uh, I have it there. Uh, that is actually Monsignor Barry's, uh, the second pastor here at St. Monica. It would be far too small for my big head. I do in my other, uh, in my office at the ministry center, which will probably do the virtual narthex from there at some point, uh, have a, I do have a Beretta. It is considered uh, either choir garb, uh, you know, liturgically speaking, uh, or it is academic garb for a, a priest, for a cleric. And that's how, why I have the one that I have. I, and it has special piping and a special tassel because of my canon law degree. And so I would have worn it. I did not attend my graduation at Catholic University for my canon law degree. I, I had to get back to the, the diocese for some responsibilities here. Uh, but I, I got the Beretta the special Beretta to have on the shelf in the office like that. Why we don't use it, I think it's a little bit more just pragmatic. It is, it is you know, it, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the, the, the way we celebrate the liturgy um, is not so much, you know, if there's a, it, it, there's not so much call for it, certainly in the Novus Ordo, and then other priests attending Mass would con-celebrate now. Uh, we go back to the notion of offering a mass intention. And some people, you know, if we're going to gather for an ordination, if we're going to gather for uh, the f a funeral and priests come and can celebrate, under the old, the, the, you know, what we call the extraordinary form, there really was not a notion of con-celebration. So the other priests would be vested in cassock and surplus and part then of their you know, presence as priests would include the Beretta. And we don't necessarily have priests regularly attending graduation ceremonies as priests in, you know, Catholic surplus and Beretta. So it's, its role as an academic garb is very limited in the world today. So uh, it, it is not the most practical. It, you know, it would not keep me from getting sunburn uh, if I wore it out on the streets of Whitefish Bay. So... Uh, I think they are nice pieces to have in the right circumstance, but it's also, you know, they're, they're not really uh, a practical, uh, you know, the more you'll see in, in Europe, uh, a little bit of a return among the young clergy of what they call the soutane. Um, you know, it's a black brimmed hat uh, that, that priests wear, so... Uh, so Emily is pointing out that kind of like the t teachers, professors don't wear academic gowns in almost all high school, right, until commencement. Uh, and then even then you have different types of hats. You know, the, the graduates would wear the mortar board. Uh, that can be an academic garb. Some you'll see in, you know, the doctorates will wear a sort of beret type of hat or a puffy hat. And then there were, you know, throughout Europe, different universities would have different traditions for that. Uh, so you don't see that much anymore. I'm going to go to one of the questions that was sent to me ahead of time, asking why face-to-face -face confessions? Um, and I'm going to take the question to mean, uh, you know, that we verbally share. Um, and I, I've shared this anecdote. I can talk a little bit face to, you know, the question of pragmatically face-to-face. Uh, but let's first talk about why we as Catholics have a tradition of what we call auricular spoken confession. Um, there is, it's a tradition that goes back, you know, to early Middle Ages Irish confessionalism, gift of the Irish to the church. Here, so here's the anecdote I often use. A young couple comes to me for counseling about a year, married for about a year. And the, dis, the differences of personality that are, whether, they're, whether they're, there's enough consistency in the experience to say, yes, men and women are different. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, however you want to phrase it. But there are differences. And the, they come to counseling after one year, and it's a communications issue. And we're figuring out that it's a communications issue. And she is upset, the bride is upset, the wife is upset, that he does not say, I love you enough. 
and I would ask, well, do you believe that he loves you? Well, yes, I believe that he loves me. I know that he loves me, but I want him to say it. I want to hear it from time to time more than I do. And he responds, well, she knows I love her. She knows I love her. She doesn't question that. Why do I need to say it? Why do I need to have to say the words? And then there's this back and forth. It ultimately comes down to the confidence we get from hearing it and the, the strength we need to show and the, the confidence we need to show by saying it. That's what happens in the sacrament of reconciliation in confession. You show the confidence of saying it. I need to be forgiven of saying I need the Lord's love to embrace me. And you need to have the confidence when you hear the words, the priest acting on behalf of, of the Lord himself saying, you are forgiven. I absolve you of all your sins. You know, the, the people would say, why can't we just walk in the woods in a beautiful day and you know, whisper to the Lord what I've done wrong, and I'll just know, you know, by the beauty and by the breeze that I'm forgiven. The Lord will, the Lord can do what the Lord can do. I just know that the church has found and the church teaches that there's great value. There's great value personally and in, in a, not only in a spiritual way. We know that people who feel forgiven of their sins have less mental health issues, have fewer physical health issues. It is transformative of the person, and it is a reminder of the bonds we must have in the church. And because the way we do it, where it's confession and counsel, meaning we give, the priest is always to give some little nugget of advice, and then it's penance and absolution. In the council, we can help people repair the relationships to give them another point of view in absolute safety and security, we can help them begin the process of repairing or at least thinking about how they're going to repair, um, you know, the, uh, the, the difficulties of our time. So, you know, our sinfulness, remember a sin is a break. It's a break in a relationship. And when we have a break in a relationship with a loved one, with neighbor, when we have a break in culture because of, you know, nowadays racism or bias or prejudice, we need to repair that. We need to have a disposition that wants to repair it. We may not be able to, I, I can't give the advice, you know, to, to make a marriage perfect just in a few minutes in the confessional. I can't make up for, you know, years of separation between siblings because they fought and they had an argument over something that was ridiculous. But I can start someone down the path and that may not happen on a walk in the woods would be my point. So, uh, let's see. Can you give us an idea or two on some practical ways to keep our faith alive and growing, especially for those who have to stay at home? That's a great question, Amy, and it's an important question for us to, to wrestle with in, in these days. Um, I think it's an important thing that, A, you have a pattern of prayer, doesn't have to be a rigid pattern. It doesn't have to be uh, something that gets you, you know, worried that you don't complete. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, obviously different people pray the rosary. Some people strive, even though there's a different set of mysteries for each day, some people strive to do all four sets. Now it's four sets of mysteries every day. That, that requires a, you know, a good amount of time. I mean, doing one set of mysteries depending on how quick you want to do it, is 20 minutes to half hour. So if you have some time, people can do, you know, it's the, you know, the joyful, the sorrowful, the glorious, and now the luminous mysteries, the gift of uh, Pope St. John Paul. Um, so I think a pattern of prayer. So a little bit of prayer in the morning, just as you go through your morning routine, Lord, make this a good day. I think a uh, an appropriate attention to prayerfulness and Christian attitude in the course of the day. Um, you know, it, it, at home it's a little different, but I've always said one of the greatest challenges is when you're out at a restaurant, do you say grace? And if you're at a business lunch, do you say grace? Maybe it doesn't have to be where you ask everybody to start, but you know, you just take a quiet moment, you know, when they start eating and you'll just kind of, you know, with no, no big fault or all, just take a moment and fold your hands and offer a blessing, offer a prayer. 
then at the end of the day, you know, uh, and then throughout the day, your Christian attitude, do for others as you would have done to you. So hold doors and, you know, uh, be kind, be generous, uh, be, be joy-filled or expressive of joy. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we are good as Catholics. We're reminded often as Catholics to make a, uh, an examination of conscience. Uh, most anybody who's been to confession for me says we need to also make an examination of thankfulness each day. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's the balance that we need and the source that we need to remind ourselves Everything that causes us to sin, uh, often there's a resource somewhere already in our life given by God uh, that is the, the calm when we would get anxious, that is the peace when we would get angry, that is the insight when we would be distracted. And so, you know, I think the more we do an examination of blessings and graces and thanksgiving, the easier our lives get. Now, so that's personal. I think the next two layers would be family. Do you have in your home representations of your faith? Is there a crucifix at least somewhere in the house? I always say somewhere in the public areas, dining room and kitchen, in every bedroom, and then a small one over the main entrance and exit. That's always, always so you see the cross is one of the last things, and you see the cross as you're about to go open the door and welcome someone. You're going to open that door for someone to rang the bell. See that cross before before you uh, actually open the door. That's that's kind of my uh, recommendation. And then you know, so those are context. And then the last thing would be community. So personal con- personal prayer and spirituality context, how you set up your home, and then community. Uh, whether it's you know once a week going to mass, whether it's you know, more than once a week for daily mass or for some other pious devotion, uh, rosary, public rosary or group rosary or adoration, but also, you know, the community celebration of acts of service and of generosity. So I think if you have those elements, personal, and then the context, and then the community, even when you're caught alone at home, you know, those things feed the soul, those things encourage and nourish the soul. So I think that would be uh, good. I want to go back to the uh, confessions, face-to-face confessions. Uh, if the question, so I answered the question about auricular. Why do we as Catholics have auricular confession? Because we, it is a sign of strength and humility to speak the sins, and it is a, it is a true moment of comfort and uh, joy to be absolved of the sins. The next, but there was part of it, do we, you know, this allowance for many centuries, the only way to go to confession was through the screen. To do it face-to-face is is considered by many a modern uh, innovation. It actually isn't. I mean, for as long as there has been screens, there for as long as there's been the sacrament of confession, it has been, you know, the, the baseline to do it face-to-face. I don't care if you were a Middle Ages friar riding your horse between villages and the farmer, you know, saw you riding by, waved you down and said, Father, would you hear my confession? You're not going to say, nope, you got to wait to come on Saturday morning at at 9 o'clock. No, you do it face to face. I mean, we would do the screen for a sense of comfort and anonymity, and I appreciate that. Some people take comfort, though, in, in seeing, you know, a forgiving face in knowing that, you know, the, the priest is not just going through the motions and reading a magazine while, you know, you're on the other side. It's that sense of attention and that sense of comfort. So that's why we go face to face. The the same person had a question about the penitential rite at Mass. And does that constitute the same as going to confession? No, it does not. No, it does not. It is a penitential rite, and that we do call it an absolution um, that we use at the end of, you know, that prayer. Uh, you know, either we use the confidior or we use the three-part prayer. It is not the same as, uh, you know, it's not the same as going to confession. Specifically, the distinctions are the participating in the Mass has some ability to forgive venial sins. 
It has, you know, it is the healing that the very participation in the Eucharist can bring. So the penitential rite at Mass sets the stage for you to participate in the Mass. Now, this doesn't mean you don't have to confess venial sins uh, when you go to confession. And it doesn't mean that you should just simply let them build up or get ignored. It just means that you can put yourself into a proper disposition, if, even if there are venial sins. Mortal sins or sins that have, I would add, you know, mortal has a very specific definition. We can, we can go through a different time. Um, but even, you know, sort of those sins that are far more intentional, you know, yes, I fight with my, my wife and I've been forgiven of it. Uh, at what point does it become a mortal sin? I don't know, but if you're, you know, it, it's still, you know, your relationship with your wife is important enough that you go to confession for it and, and get a little little advice. So, uh, so the penitential rite sets a disposition that does uh, give us a proper disposition, even in light of venial sin. It does not do so for the, up against mortal sin. Uh, Matt McCoy is asking, do I have a chest rating? No. Um, no, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't have a chess rating. I am not that good. I enjoy the game. Uh, I, when I lived at the seminary, I often taught the, uh, you know, some of the new students, the foreign students in particular, uh, the Colombians and the Venezuelans, if they hadn't played before. And then when they got good enough to beat me, I, I, I stopped playing them. <laughs> so, no, I enjoy it. Uh, you know, it's, it's a good mental exercise, but I, I'm not so much that I have. A, a rating. Let's see. Uh, I think I've covered the, uh, the the emailed questions. We're already time flies. We're already about fifty minutes in. Um, let's see. Do we have anything that I was going to look at here? Uh, nope. I've covered all of that. So any questions that you have? So I'll talk real quick. I am going to be gone next week on on vacation. Uh, so please uh, keep me in prayer, and I'll keep you in prayer. I wasn't intending what I do. What I will post, you know, pretty much if I, whenever I visit a cathedral or a shrine or a church, I'll post some pictures uh, to. Uh, I'll post some pictures to the, you know, to my Facebook page, my Twitter, my Twitter page. So, um, you know, so please do connect up there if you can. Uh, and you, you can follow some of it. I, I'm not the type of guy that posts a lot of personal things, so you're not going to see, uh, you're not going to see a picture of every meal that I'm about to eat. Um, you're not going to see a, too many pictures of, you know, um, well, you know, I'm not going to be on a beach anywhere, so <laughs> you're not going to see a picture of, you know, my feet stretched out on the sand or something like that. Uh, let's see, Ryan posted. Fortunately or unfortunately, confession is a dying, you know, sacrament, arguments on both sides of the theological spectrum. Um, it, it is, it is, and it's, it's a tough uh, aspect to, to teach people. Um, and that's, that's a bit of a cop-out for us priests, but there is, there is a sense of, uh, you know, how do we teach people about their own sinfulness, about their own need for reconciling, um, reconciling with the Lord, reconciling with others, without creating more scrupulosity, because scrupulosity is a problem, and the church does not want us to be scrupulous. And scrupulosity is essentially finding a sin in everything you do. It's a, it's a, it's a church. Hmm, I want to be real careful here. It's a, it's a, it's a church type of approach. That is almost obsessive compulsive. So you know, I I forgot to you know, Father, I don't think the, my fingers touched the holy water before I made the sign of the cross going into church. That's scrupulosity. That's finding a sin where it may not be there, or finding you know something that's really a sin, or so it's it's finding that something that's not really a sin, thinking it is a sin, or finding you know something that may be a sin, but it wasn't really what you did. It wasn't really what you uh, participated in. And your culpability because of that confusion is, is mitigated. So, uh, so there's this, the side where the church has wrestled with the question of scrupulosity. But going to confession is good. You know, minimum once a year. Practice once a month. Um, 
but you know really make it a reflection uh, that's that's more than just you know you know number and you know kind and number as they used to as they do say but make it a reflection of you know this is where I've sinned and I'm open to a conversion of heart Anita I've hesitated to ask this but since there aren't any other questions do you ever get distracted while celebrating mass okay I am gonna let you in on a secret I think every priest does at a certain point um, some of it are distractions and, and it's you'd probably be surprised the things that do distract me it's not crying babies that doesn't really bother me at all it's you know it's right now it's more often I am just saying to myself I'm sweating so much um, I do you know sometimes it's a little bit of do I have enough hosts you know I, you know I've started the Eucharistic prayer I'm I've already done the institution narrative did, did I do enough so I do have some of that um, and then you know the, the the biggest thing you can tell I've gotten distracted if sometimes it's because I trip up on the words but more often if I so trip up on the words that I use the old translation so you know remember it was about 15, 14 years ago that we retranslated uh, the new the missile the sacramentary begin the missile so the, the glory you know the glory at the beginning has a new translation there are some new elements and aspects to the the you know the Nicene Creed and so that's often where I get tripped up if I'm kind of watching and paying attention sometimes you know I will see something that I do feel I have to attend to hot summer days I'm always worried that a server is going to feel faint on a hot summer day at, at one of our parishes so sometimes while I'm praying the Our Father I'm, I'm able to say the words while looking over uh, I think it's a skill that every mom has probably learned, um, but sometimes that is a distraction. Fortunately, you know, so long as I, uh, you know, for the validity of the Mass, and it does, this doesn't happen a lot. I, I you know, I, I don't want you to think, oh, Father's mind is, you know, all over the place. No, I, 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 I believe, I hope, I'm a pretty focused uh, person of prayer because then there are some things that you would think I would notice that I don't because I'm focused on the prayer. I don't. You know, you, people tell me after Mass, people will come up to me, oh, I'm so sorry my son screamed and ran down the central aisle. So I, I, don't, I don't remember it. I don't remember it. So most of the time I am focused, almost uh, overly so. Um, but so long as the priest, you know, does, goes into the Mass with the right intention to celebrate the Mass of the Church and does so with the proper form and matter, and you know form is the words if I got up and just said yep this is body this is blood we're done not that's not gonna cut it I have to do the prayer of the church uh, so the church does not want the mistakes of, uh, of a human person you know the faults and failings of a human person to undermine the sacraments unnecessarily so I mean obviously there is a certain you have to draw the line somewhere but um, there was a time here just uh, Oh gosh, two years ago, I did get distracted, and I started after I had done the institution. This is my body; take this, all of you. And then I picked up the chalice and I started that same paragraph again. This is my body, and the deacon father caught my attention. And because I had been distracted, I looked down and just caught the wrong paragraph on it and started it. So I went back you know made sure I started that paragraph proper for the cup and so then it was a valid celebration of the Eucharist if I had gone and done the uh, the institution of only the the host the bread the saboria both times and no one told me then it would have been an invalid mass but uh, someone caught it and uh, caught my attention and uh, everything turned out fine so so yes, Anita, I hope I haven't shattered anybody's uh, view of me or of priests in general. Uh, I think every priest sometimes does get um, a little distracted. So uh, that brings us to uh, to our hour. We are, it is well, a couple minutes, 7.56. We've got a couple more minutes if there's another question. Um, 
we will likely have another to preach in a podcast. Obviously, not this week, but it'll be out next Monday. So we're going to record early before I leave on vacation. We will have, uh, they will still have confessions on Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, have a nice birthday next Monday. Thank you, Amy, for remembering that. Yes, next Monday, July 27th is my birthday. I will be uh, 54 years old on that day. And uh, um, I think I was away last year on my birthday, too. So this is becoming a little pattern that I just go and hide on my on my birthday. I, I kind of just do my own thing. Um, but thank you. If I am not mistaken on my birthday, I'll probably be in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, either Bemidji or Duluth. So I'm not, it all depends how, how much driving I want to do on any given day and how many different things I want to go see on any given day. All right. So anything else I do wish I want to, if anybody knows how to do that, split screen uh that split screen on facetime uh you know on, on the shared screen but you know tell me i'd love to be able to do that for you to show you uh you know we i can do it in all other formats but i can't seem to get facebook to do it for me so all right thank you fran such a young pup yes so all right. Well, let's just take a moment and we'll finish with a, with a little prayer, uh, a prayer of hopefulness and thanksgiving. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we pray in thanksgiving for the many joys, blessings, and graces which you give us in this life. May each of those contribute to our strength, our confidence, our hope, and our decision to seek to bring you to a needy, needy world. We ask your blessing upon all who have shared in this time together. God's blessings upon you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Go in peace. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Blessings to you.